Hello and welcome to Off the Fence, a podcast where we deconstruct difficult decision making so we can figure out what keeps us stuck and more importantly, how do we get unstuck? I'm your host, Karen Covey, a former divorce lawyer, mediator, and arbitrator turned coach, author, and entrepreneur. With me today is my guest, Mark Bradford. Mark is an author of both fiction and nonfiction books, the host of a top 5% global podcast, a licensed UAV pilot, a speaker, and a full stack web developer, as well as a coach. He created the Alchemy for Life coaching system and won best new author in 2019 for his epic, The Sword and the Sunflower Trilogy, which sounds really interesting. Mark, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for the welcome. I appreciate it. So I'd like to dive in by focusing, I mean, you you have done so many things and you're accomplished in so many areas, but I'd like to focus our discussion today more on the coaching stuff and the, the coaching system that you created. But before we dive into all of that, I was wondering if you could share a little bit of your story, your personal story with the audience. Oh, sure. Uh, the, uh, the genesis of um, my coaching system actually came from my divorce. And so when I was going through the divorce with the kids, I ended up having them full time, which is a, a little bit unusual. And I decided to take them to a psychologist to make sure that they were okay. And as I've said, I didn't want to be Obi-Wan creating Darth Vader. So, cause I, I'm just a, I'm just some guy, right? I mean, you know, parenting doesn't come with a manual and certainly there isn't enough documentation out there for what happens during a divorce, especially with children. So I thought I would do that. And of course, the psychologist said, you know, you're doing everything you can. And in spite of what's happening around them, they are remarkably well adjusted. And I thought, oh, I think I can get up now. Uh, and she's kind of focused on me and said, you're doing everything you can for them, but what are you doing for you? And then that's when I kind of froze. And I see you nodding because that's probably a very common thing. And I wasn't doing anything for me. I didn't, I didn't matter. Right. And so what I learned was I did matter. And that if like they say with the planes, if you don't put your mask on first, there's not going to be anything left of you to take care of them, the people you care about. So it really got me thinking. I thought, well, wait a second. What is like, what's life made of then? And I figured out life was made of three things, not a box of chocolates, not, you know, um, other things. It's made of time, energy, and resources. And no matter what you do, you're dealing with those three things. You go to work and you give them your time and energy and they give you resources back. And I see you doing like some mental calculations for certain things in your life, right? I think everyone does that, right? Uh, but it really does work that way. And then I ended up figuring out that we spend these three facets, or we spend these three things in five facets of life. And then, we, it, and I envision it as a flask, just like what's behind me. Um, and where we pour it out every day, we get our time, energy, and resources. We pour it out for this, our hobbies, our children, our friends, our loved ones, our job, our passions, all that stuff. And sometimes it's 7 p.m. and you're like, wait, <laughs> wait, I need some more. So that's sort of where the coaching came from. And that sort of was my story, um, at least in a nutshell about divorce. But I'm happy to answer whatever specific questions you might have. No, I, I was just wondering, I like that idea of time, energy, and resources. So let's say it's seven o'clock at night and you've poured out all of your time, energy, and resources, and there's there's nothing left in your flask or cup or what jug, whatever it is that you carry around. Um, what do you do? Well, sometimes you don't. I mean, sometimes you don't. And that's where a lot of people just sort of, I don't want to say give up, but they have nothing left to give. So either they dig deeper to find more reserves or they just say, well, I'm, I'm just done. You know, it's a lot of times like you'll, you'll talk to someone on the phone and say, Hey, do you want to do this? And they'll be like, you know, dude, I'm in for the night. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not making any more decisions. I'm done. Okay. I'm going to sit on, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm going to stare at trash TV. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to think. And that's where that energy comes from because energy isn't just physical, it's mental and it's emotional. And we forget about those aspects because the thing that's preventing you from going to work out isn't physical. I mean, if, if it only relied on you being physically capable of working out, you'd work out all the time. You'd be, you'd be He-Man or, or, or She-Man she or whatever you want to be. But it's the emotional gas that you don't have. Oh, I don't feel like it. I don't want to get in the car. 
I don't know how good I'll do today. Maybe tomorrow. Yeah, that sounds convincing. Tomorrow is better. And that's kind of what we do. And that, that's interesting because the whole idea, I mean, I, I think people discount how much energy making mm. decisions takes, using brain power takes, and just being emotional, having emotions, especially strong emotions or negative emotions, takes a lot of that energy that you have. Or, or am I, you know, do you have a different experience? Oh, absolutely. 100%. And I'm sure your experience in, in dealing with people, especially through divorce, is probably energy is just right in your face constantly. You're like, oh my God, this is what's preventing this. This is where this is, is to blame, blah, blah, blah. It is the energy by far. So what what are someone's options if they are if they're out of energy? If their tank is just empty and they're, like you said, I'm going to binge watch garbage television for the rest of the night because I just can't do anything else right mm -hmm. now. Is there a way that they can replenish so they can be more productive? Or is the game to not drain yourself till, till you're on zero? I mean, is it, which one is it? Or is it both? It's both. It's absolutely both. And what we find usually when I do the coaching and people fill out this balance sheet is that there is something draining their energy. They look and they go, oh my God, my productivity column is like this long. But my fun column and my spirituality column, my learning column, all the things that would give me energy back, yeah, I'm not caring about me, so I don't replenish it. Or I just get by in survival mode, which probably a lot of people who are divorced or going through a divorce or, or dealing with their kids and stuff, especially probably the 50-50 people, they probably put all their energy in that 50% when the kids are around. And when the kids aren't around, they're like, oh, oh and they probably do very little with that time. Actually, you know, it's, it's interesting you should say that because I was just talking with someone who it's it's almost the opposite. It's like they put all of their energy into the kids when the kids are with them. Mm -hmm. And then when the kids aren't with them, they have to put all of their energy into their job to make up for the time that the job suffered while they were with their kids. And right. that becomes the hamster wheel. Yes, because there's only like as you were saying, there's only so much time or energy to go around. And yes, to, to, to address the other thing you said, you can not only replenish it, but get more energy. And there are things in life that can give you energy. In fact, they can even be things that previously took energy from you or take energy from someone else. And I use the, the quick example of someone who has to go to their kid's little league game or whatever, right? And for a lot of people, that's very draining. They don't want to see it as, yeah, okay, great. I'm here to show up for you. I brought sandwiches. That's good. Oh my God, when do we get to go home, right? It's just, in they're reading a book or they're doing something else and they're really drained by it. There are people who are super into the, the sport or super into their kid. And they're like, yeah, this was the best thing in the world. And then they go and say, let's get our fries or our ice cream or whatever. And they are jazzed and energized by it. So the same thing can have different effects on different people. So you have to find the things that, replenish the energy. And if I may be babble a little bit, um, a lot of people have a number of barriers. One of the barrier is giving yourself a license to have fun. And that's one of the big issues with people that uh, when they want to write a book is writing a book sounds, feels too much like screwing around because they can't look anywhere and go, oh yeah, like all those other people who go eight to five to write a book. That's that's not the way it works. Most people are writing a book and they're off time and it feels like play. Or they can sneak the book in between clients or whatever and go, oh, I should probably be getting more clients or, oh, okay, but I have to make dinner. Yeah, that sure would be fun. Oh, I got to stop screwing around. And if you give yourself a license to write, then it will happen just like the other things. That's interesting. Um yeah, that, that's really interesting. What about the people who, for them, writing the book is just another time and energy drain? It's like they they want to write it, but it's more like work than play. Yeah. Right? And then so they're doing they, it wrong. Uh, interesting. I, so say more about that. Yeah. How do, so how do you change that? There should be, there should be, yeah. So I believe humbly that they're doing it wrong then. Uh, writing is is work. It could be a lot of work. But I think people find time and time again, the things that you put the most effort in typically generate the most joy. 
I mean, it really, it really gives back to you what you give to it. I mean, there are things that people do that people say, man, you're fanatical about that. Man, I could never do that. that I don't have the, the time or I don't have the patience to do that. And you're like, oh my God, it's the greatest thing in the world. I love doing this. And it's because they put all that energy in and it reflects back to them all this energy, sometimes even more energy. So I think if you're writing, and I could go on and on, so I don't want to take too much time, but when it, there's a different way to write fiction than there is to write nonfiction. You know, obviously, fiction, uh, nonfiction for most people is a bit more structured. It's a hierarchical arrangement of thoughts. So that can take some mental, uh, you know, mental focus to go and, and you know, re-looking at things and sheets and things to go, is this a paragraph? Is this a whole different chapter? Oh, wait, I need to expand on this. This wasn't clear. And then fiction is supposed to be fun, but not good fiction. <laughs> good fiction should take some work because you also need a whiteboard and you need to plan out the, the what I call the framework, which most people call the outline, and then the characters and then the characters' conversations, and they're all put it against each other. And if you're working on the wrong part of it, you're going to have writer's block. Interesting. What do you mean by if you're working on the wrong part of it, you're going to have writer's block? So if you're focused on the dialogue, right, and you're having two characters talk and you're like, this is really fun, and you're like, but I don't know what to have him say next or anything. It's because you don't know their motivation. So you didn't focus on the characters. You're just having two people talk. So of course, you're never going to make any progress. Or if you're having characters interact and do things, and you're like, well, now I'm stuck. I put them at the end of this bridge. Well, you didn't work on the outline. So if you're going to try to get him out of the, off the bridge, you can't because you didn't plan what was supposed to happen there. You have to focus on the outline. So I think if you focus where you're supposed to, It'll just keep coming out until it's done. And you'll bounce back and forth between those things. That's interesting. And, you know, to, to sort of rein the conversation in a little bit from writing, it sounds like a similar analogy could be made for anything. I mean, if you put your focus where you're supposed to be focusing on, um, you're going to have a much better result and probably a lot you know, it'll be a lot more enjoyable. I know depending on what you're focusing on, it may not be fun, but you're going to have a better time of it if you're focusing on the right thing at the right time. Right. I think that's a, an excellent point. Absolutely. That's worth writing down. I mean, that's really important that people do focus on that. We tend to focus on the things that are easiest or that we can depend on and we know the outcome versus the things that frighten us or pe things we don't want to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. So in your coaching session, I want to get into to that, the alchemy for life coaching, uh, what do you call it? System? Technique? Yeah, let's call it a system. I like to think in systems. Okay, perfect. So what is the alchemy for life coaching system all about? So as I said, what happens is um, we we regard life as time, energy, and resources. And what happens is I have something called the balance sheet. I thought it was clever, maybe not. And so what it is, is that it's a way for people to fill out the five columns. I mentioned, you know, spirituality, fun, learning, productivity, obligation, that sort of thing. And they basically just fill out these five columns to see where their life is at. Not where they want to be, but what they're doing right now. And sometimes it's embarrassing, right? You say, well, I have a nine to five job. That's it. And I, I take care of the kids. Well, you don't do anything for fun? No. Oh, okay. We see the problem right away, right? Or so then we kind of expand into what they want to do and so forth. Once they once they put that out, we start to see the goals just sort of rear their heads. Like a lot of coaching systems, it's I have a goal. Can you help me do that? Whoa, what stopped you before? <laughs> the thing that stopped you before is going to stop you again because we're not addressing it. We need to take a step back. So I look at this and I say, life is a game. I'm showing you the board. So once you see the board, you go, oh, that's why I can't lose weight because I want to I want to meal prep, but my job doesn't allow me to meal prep. So I'm just going to end up, I'm going to meal prep once or twice, complain about it at work, and then I'm going to end up just eating out every day because I can't. So you have to change that before you can change the other thing. So what do you say to someone? I mean, all right, to use your analogy, life is a, you know, a board, you show people the board and they're like, oh, great. but what happens to the rules? What if the rules are stacked against them? Like in your weight loss analogy, I just don't have time to meal prep or, 
I don't like to meal prep. I don't like to cook or I don't, you know, so if somebody is in a situation where the rules seem stacked against them or like they're, they're going through a divorce and everything is against me, what do you say to them? Oh, let me cheat. I mean, that's, that's a, it, but seriously, I mean, we cheat. It's wonderful. No, it, no, it's wonderful. It's a good cheating. It's good cheating because we go around these rules in a way that no one would think to go around them. And okay, so, say more and, about that. Yeah. I, yeah. That, that probably requires an explanation. So we uncover the fact that something might be caused by something else. And when we attack the something else, that's really simple. Let me give you an example. Somebody, uh, as part of the coaching, it wasn't a major goal, but it did spring up as giving them more fun. They wanted to play the piano. Oh, okay. Well, do you have the uh, do you have the time for it? How do we make? Oh, yeah. Uh, but I don't really have the energy, uh, and I don't know, and I don't know how to do this. Okay. So what happened was, she was driving her kids to these sporting events like all week long. A lot of her kids, as a single mom, all week long and doing this stuff, right? So I said, so she said, I get home and I'm exhausted and this and this. I said, I know this sounds weird, but ask your daughter if she wants you to be there. And I said, I know this is weird, but just ask her. She ended up asking her daughter and her daughter said, well, honestly, mom, no. Like she said, I kind of feel stressed because you're, I see you out in the audience and you're reading a book and stuff. And I know like it's no fun for you. So you could just drop me off. She gained three hours in a week because she asked her daughter a question because she was afraid to be a bad mom. And she's actually being a better mom by letting her daughter breathe and her get the energy to go home and do the stuff that she wants to do. So she ends up being a better person in general. What do you do for the person who comes to you, especially because when you're going through a divorce, for example, there mm -hmm. is not much fun in any of that, right? So what do you do to the person who comes and says, you know, a, I don't have time for fun or B, I don't even know what fun is anymore. It's been so long. Either they're going through the divorce or it's, it's happened in their past and they're just, you know, they're so used to the grind. They don't even know what they, what, what's fun anymore. Right. And as you know, divorce changes you, you knew who you were with somebody, but you try to find out who you are. And so you kind of become this new person because then you start exploring things you may not have explored because you were too busy being a spouse and a, and a father or mother, right? Like you change and that's fine. And that's a good thing. Sometimes people fear change, but that's a good thing. Um, people lose their fun a lot. In fact, so much that I gave a talk at a, at a major corporation in front of a bunch of CEOs that were transitioning. And the person who hired me looked at me and said in front of everyone, I want to hire you to find my fun. Because she could see by looking at the, she, she clearly didn't do any fun stuff. And, yeah. and right. And you're saying very validly that, you know, you're going through a divorce and you're so drained by that <laughs> every three months character assassination or whatever it is that you go through, right? Like all that stuff that happened that can happen in a divorce that you just are like, well, I'm just glad to be home and sitting in my, my pajamas. Oh my God. You know, I, I think it comes back to the self-care and the self-love thing, which is so important. And the problem is that those terms are so overused, people forget the meaning. And they feel like, well, that's a ooga booga, foofy thing. I, I, I don't do that. I work for a living, right? Well, what do you mean by self-care and self-love? Okay, so I do think they're two distinct things. I think self-care is essentially taking care of yourself the way you would take care of your children and loved ones, right? There, there are things where you're like, I'm just going to work uh, two more hours. If your daughter called you and said, yeah, hi, I'm going to stay at work two more hours. You'd be like, honey, really? You, how are you feeling? Are you stressed? You know, really? Do you think that's healthy? Like you might get some more work done, but probably not. Why don't you just, it'll be fine. Like we need to treat ourselves that way. Right. We need to say, do really, you know, take care of yourself. And people think self, um, self love is just basically going, well, then I'm just going to get a bath when I get home and I'll have my rose petals and, and, and read and stuff. That's great, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't make it out so that it's this special thing that only happens once a year. I mean, again, if it was a loved one, if you're madly in love with your husband, there are things that you would do and say, I'm going to make his the greatest meal ever. Cause he loves, you know, he loves a roast and I'm going to make him a roast just because, you know, and think, cause I care. Well, why don't you do that for yourself? Why don't you take yourself out for 
a martini and a steak or something or 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 whatever or say you know what i'm going to go down downtown and i'm going to wander aimlessly through this big library because i love books and i'm just going to do that i'm going to grab a coffee and i'm going to sit there i don't have a plan i don't care but that's what i like and i'm not going to feel guilty for liking that okay so the focus of this podcast is decision making and just to play devil's advocate with you here. So you said everything is time, energy, and, you know, and resources. resources. And so, and somebody is in this, they're they're talking about self-care, self-love. How do you, when you don't have enough time, energy, and resources, decide, look, I'm going to spend the time to go wander around the library because I love books. But I know that by doing that, I'm not spending time with my kids or I'm not spending time doing the things that I need to do to get through a divorce or a tough situation or move house or whatever it is. I have these responsibilities and I'm going to shirk those responsibilities and decide instead that I'm going to go wander around the library. I mean, how, how do you help people do that? And that's exactly the framing that traps them in that world is the framing that you used, which is I'm shirking my responsibilities and I should be taking care of my kids. And if I don't, I'm, I'm this person that's less than what I think of myself as, and see you trap yourself in this prison by doing that, by saying I'm shirking my responsibilities versus um, there's only so much of me to go around. And it's not, well, if I don't do it, no one will do it. Well, okay, then no one will do it then. And, and I'm not talking about to the level of like disregarding your children and they're running outside in a diaper, you know, in the field or something like that. I'm just saying, if you've never pushed back, you don't know where that wall is. And the thing is, what you'll find a lot with kids, at least what I found in, in my anecdotal personal experience was giving them time to be by themselves. Oh my God, it's like you gave them a birthday present. Like, they're perfectly happy to have me time. In fact, they're thrilled to have me time. Um, I used to go and, and shop with my daughter and go out and stuff. And we'd come back home and we'd look at each other and go, me time? Yeah, me time. And she would disappear in a room and I'd go and do something else. And it was it was great because I had zero guilt. She had zero guilt and we got to do what we wanted to. It was, it was, it was priceless. It was such a nice thing. You know, you, I think you've hit on something really, really important for people to hear. It's that because the consequence of making a decision to do something fun or do something for yourself is often that you feel guilty about doing it, which means it's not fun, even though you're doing the fun thing, right? Yeah. So how can we, you know, as especially as parents, get to that point where we don't have the guilt? And it sounds like you did it by having a conversation with your kid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, fact, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's the conversation. It's, it's, we, we sort of define these things in our head without involving the people we're defining. Like, oh, my daughter wouldn't like that. Well, did you ask her? Well, no, I'm sure she wouldn't, you know, and I'm sure lots of misunderstandings with couples happen that way too. We're like, well, I didn't think you would like this. I thought you don't like doing this thing. I don't think, I didn't think you'd like going to an art museum. You never asked me. I don't know. You know, so I think we make these definitions and then we don't check in with the real world. And I think sometimes you just have to. And um, I think kids actually appreciate a little bit of vulnerability once in a while. I'm not a big fan of like, you know, breaking down and crying for your kids or and, and having them parent you, which is very destructive. Oh, I'm talking about just being vulnerable and going, look, I, I don't know. Like I'm kind of torn because I don't want to, I don't want to ignore you. But but also, you know, I'm kind of tired from this other thing. Would you understand? And they, and almost certainly they'd say, oh, my God, yes, I'll be, I'm in my room. Bye. You know, it, it's just the way it works. That's so that that's such an interesting shift of perspective or, as you put it, shift of the frame. Mm-hmm. Um, how else do we use framing or does the framing that we use get us stuck? What a, what a wonderful and timely question. So the book I'm writing right now, I make a reference to something that happened a long time ago. Uh, let me try to be concise, which is very difficult for me. Um, there was, um, for, for the longest time, scholars thought that people in the past couldn't see the color blue. They would, they, they would look in the text, and even Homer in the Iliad, he calls the water wine-colored. Um, 
doesn't mention that the, the blue sky has all these other uh, all these other colors for the for the the water other than blue. Blue is mentioned like once, and in most texts, it's it's hardly ever mentioned, right? So what they finally found after thinking we were colorblind in the past and and, and other things is that the way that our language develops is that we typically develop black, white, red, and then it comes after that, and blue is almost always last. And so the lesson from this, which I'm referencing in my book, is that if you can't say it, then you can't see it. So to them, blue was typically a darker color, or it was just like black, or it was just like green. And there's a lot of cultures that simply think of blue and green together. They don't even have a word that separates them, uh, as opposed to this Namibian tribe that had all these words for green. And and here's the interesting thing. in, in uh, You and I, growing up in the United States, I presume, we have a specific word for light red. We call it pink. pink it's just light yeah. red, but we call it pink, right? In, um, in, in, in the USSR and Russia and so forth, they have a specific name for light blue. We don't. We call it light blue, just like we would, should be calling it light red. So guess what happens when you test a bunch of uh, native English people to pick out the pink among a whole bunch of colors versus those people? They pick it out faster. Reverse it, and they pick out the blue, light blue faster because they have a name for it. So their mind can see it. And so using that concept, I think if you don't name it, if you don't talk about it, it can become very invisible to you. That's interesting. And so, but how do we, because the problem with the whole concept of changing the frame is that people don't even know they're in a frame. Right. They don't know, or they don't know that they're framing something a certain way. They just think that's the way it is. So to your point, they don't see it because they just think that's the way it is. So how can you help somebody or get somebody, what can somebody do to start changing that frame to see things differently. Right. So, so besides seeing a coach, which will see things, which one of the purposes and jobs of the coaches, you know, is to see things from the outside in a, in a perspective that they're never going to see and bring things to their attention. They can, I guess, other than that, I guess they can just expand their mind in ways, talk to friends and, and ask people and, and, you know, humbly say, this is what I'm seeing. Does that make sense to you? And they may have friends that will say, you know, no, no, that's not how it works. Or they may also share experiences, just like joining groups and things, where you can share experiences from an outside perspective. Interesting. So, you know, this this whole conversation is fascinating. But because you and I have talked before, I also know that you have an interesting perspective on relationships that I wanted to dive into Um before we, you know, before we get too far afield. So can you tell me, I mean, your, uh, in your opinion, what are relationships based on? So in my opinion, all relationships are based on one thing, which usually shocks people and they're already shaking their heads. And I wrote a series of books starting with the status game, the status game two, and I have a new one coming out, which is essentially the third one. And the status game basically means all relationships are based on status. And as I kind of joke, I mean, sure, you can say, yeah, I'm the emperor of Europe. Wow, I'm really impressed. Let's have a relationship. That's a part of it. But it's status that we have on what I like to think of as we all have a dashboard, like in our car, of gauges. And so the bigger the gauge, the more important it is to you, just like in your car. The one right in the center that's big and giant shows you how fast you're going and how likely you are to die, right? So, Or get a ticket, right? So we have these dashboards with gauges on it for various things, like... Uh, if we're in a romantic relationship, we have gauges for women, typically height, uh, you know, how much you feel protected, uh, the, the dependability of a person, uh, there's attractiveness, there's attractiveness to others. Um, there's all sorts of different gauges of different sizes. And that's what dictates basically the status on these gauges dictates what you're going to do. Okay. I got to push back on this one. All right. What about love? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a romantic. I'm an absolutely hopeless romantic. I'm someone who believes in magic and I believe in all that stuff. But the, the logical part of my brain always push back and uh, push pushes back and says, I can de I can de I can deconstruct that. And so it can be deconstructed into um 
and to and to gauge us in things. I think if you if you look if you could see this magical thing floating in front of you, and you looked in gauges when some if you looked at somebody who you felt in love with, I bet on the important gauges they'd be they'd be registering really high. And you could say push back further and say, well, maybe people don't have a type. Well, they do. I mean, there's there's reasons. Nurture in nature, that's caused you to be attracted to certain kinds of people, certain people who make you feel a certain way. Mm -hmm. And it might not be something physical, but it might be a spiritual connection that you have with somebody. It might be an emotional connection. They're very emotionally mature. It might be an intellectual connection that you really respect the person's mind and the rest of it comes after that. And you say, ooh, la, la, later. You know, that stuff, that stuff happens. I mean, there's there has to be a physical attraction as well because that's just how we're built. So- yes. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I, is there a love gauge? Well, I guess I call it the love dashboard. So there's three dashboards that okay. we have. We have one for right. love, so it's our, our romantic partner. We have one for friendship, and then we have one for ourselves and what, what we like about ourselves. So when you look in the mirror, you go, I feel good about me being me. And it's because you register high on your important gauges. And when you look in there and go, oh, boy, I don't like what I did, or you know, this does not feel like me, or your friends are like, yeah, that's not you. Then you're, you're registering low on the gauges that are important. What happens? I mean, all right. So you've got these dashboards and you've got all these gauges. Mm -hmm. Are they the same for every person? Absolutely not. Not only are they not the same for every person, because, you know, different people are, are attracted to different people. There are people that say, look, I just want to be a good parent. I don't care about making a zillion dollars. I don't care about this. I just want to have integrity. I just want to have honesty. Or you can have someone who says, I need to have accomplishments. I just, because of my childhood, I grew up poor and I'm never going to be poor and so on and so forth, right? Not only are they different for people, but they literally change for you in your life. It's one of the reasons people split up because their love gauge gauges shrink and grow depending on their maturity and their and happenings. You can have a gauge for like how how much of an artist someone is. Oh, what a beautiful poet this guy is, right? Oh my God, that's what attracted to him to me. His long hair playing his guitar on the couch. But you get to a point where you have kids and you go, okay, dude, get a job. Because like that gauge shrinks and now the one for dependability and the one for trustworthiness and the one for provider goes a lot bigger because you want a good dad for your kids. And the, and, the, and the guitar playing hippie guy is not doing it for you anymore. So that stuff changes. Just like you grow as a person so you grow apart from someone. And so when someone says they're growing apart, I always think, oh, their gauge has really changed. Is there a way, if someone sees that, like our, in your language, our gauges are changing. I don't want that to happen. I would like to sustain this relationship. Hmm. Is there a way to make that happen? Is there a way to recalibrate your gauges, so to speak? Absolutely. And I think I, I so... Uh, I think you can do it without losing who you are. Like if a gauge changes for a legitimate reason, then then it changed. Like leave it alone. Like that's just you. You've you've matured. You have a different like or dislike or something or importance, right? So your partner has to adjust to that, just like you have to adjust to that for your partner as well. And so I think they're the ones that kind of have to adjust with with a lot of intimate discussions about that and say, you know, I. I <laughs> I know in the olden days we used to go out drinking and stuff like that. And that was fun. But now I kind of need a little bit more intellectual stimulation. You know, now I kind of need somebody who has a bit more ambition or something like that. And I mean, that's really where the conversation is, I think. Do you think the gauges change out of a conscious decision? Or is it something that just happens because of the environment? I mean, what makes the gauges change? Yeah, the yeah. So that's the gauges change based on some of the fundamental building blocks of psychology that we have that cause us to go towards. Um, go. So Freud had a, a concept called the plain the pain pleasure principle. He's the one that developed it, and everyone expanded on it. And it's basically that that uh, humans are binary that we go towards pleasure, we go away from pain. That's it. And you can break down every single thing in your life into the, that binary. And I know it's, again, deconstructing and demystifying, but even the most nuanced things in your life, your, your spirituality, the, you know, wanting to be a good person, that all breaks down into seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And I think th that formula changes your gauges. But when you say, can you forcibly change them? It's kind of like saying, I really like vanilla and I don't like chocolate. Well, I should make myself like chocolate. Like, 
why? Like, if that's your like, that's your like. I think self-discovery can can maybe figure out that you don't really like tall guys and you keep picking tall guys who are a-holes and you wonder why you date a-holes. It's because you feel protected and protected equals tall. So you always, but you ignore the protection gauge. So I think a little bit of self-discovery can help that. Interesting. But you don't think that the gauges are, that it's a conscious decision-making process of, I want to be this or have this or do this. I, I do think so, but behind it is a be- because, and it's discovering the because of it is, is discovering the why of it is where you're really going to do your work. So if you say, I want this, I would say, well, why? Like, you know, if, like if you said, well, look, I, I want to change this case. I want um, a lot more wealth. I mean, there's obvious reasons as to why you have it, but if you're happy and you're fairly well to do and you say, no, I want a lot more wealth, I would say, well, why? And you could say, well, because of my childhood, I don't ever want to be wanting, or I want to, I don't want my kids to ever suffer, or vacations are really important for my mental health. Ah, okay. So those are the things you really want. Interesting. It's an, a very interesting perspective and in a, a way I ha- you have a very unique way of framing things um, and, and putting the discussion um, that I haven't heard before. So it's, okay. it has been a very interesting conversation. <laughs> um, and I want to wrap it up by asking what I admit is a totally unfair question. So this is, I mean, this podcast has to do with all things decision-making. What's the best decision you've ever made? Wow. Um, I guess my answer is a very intimate answer. So I'm, 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 um, I guess I've made two. I think I've made two decisions that have really, Three. Okay. There's there's three decisions that I've really made. Um, uh, am I allowed to be a coward and pick the least the, the least controversial one? You it is, you can pick whatever you choose. Okay. I will say um, my cowardly answer is to write books. Is to immerse myself into writing because it's been such an interesting discovery process. It's been such a a valuable thing, and what's come out of it, especially the sword and the sunflower, has just been such an amazing thing that never would have happened. So I really think it's a bit, I never considered it a decision. So that's why I struggled with it. Like you don't decide to write books, but I guess looking back, you could call it that. That's okay. my cowardly answer. I'll take cowardly. What okay. is just real quick. I know we've got to wrap up, but what, tell, can you tell me what is the sword and the sunflower? What's it about? Sure. So, the, so the sword and the sunflower is, is an epic coming of age hero's journey set a thousand years in the future after something horribly cataclysmic happened right around now in which uh, the earth lost most of its population. And yes, when I was writing this, all of a sudden COVID happened. And then uh, two other things I was writing suddenly showed up in the news and I thought, am I causing this? But, um, (laughs) but uh, it's so basically a stable medieval society shows up and it's about basically a man who is a um, now is an assassin because um, of something horrible that happened to him, absolutely horrible, painful. He wants to forget. And he just basically takes jobs to to be alone in his pain. But he takes one last job that should pay an insane amount of money. And it changes him in the world forever. He is actually a part of the world is completely revealed to him. And he meets somebody that becomes very special to him. Interesting. It sounds like a fascinating book. Where can people find it? So people can either go to markbradford.org and see all my goodies there, uh, my my books, the reviews and so forth, or they can always go on Amazon and look for me and and my books as well. So The Sword and the Sunflower is an easy one to to search for. It's the only book with that name for now. Um, And you can see all my books on Amazon as well. They're available Kindle, uh, paperback, hardcover, and even audiobook for two of the books that I recorded myself. Wow. Well, Mark, this has been a really, really interesting interview. There's that word again. So I, yeah, <laughs> but it is. You you have a very unique point of view, and I appreciate your sharing it with with me, with the audience. Um, tell people if they want to, you know, where can they find you if they want to. So. They, again, they, they can go to markbradford.org. If they're interested in, in the coaching stuff, 
They can go to Alchemy for Life. That's literally writing out the word Alchemy for Life and putting a period between the four and the life. So it's a dot life and not a dot com. Ah. They can also find my podcast, which is called Alchemy for Life. Uh, and that's on iTunes and Spotify and all those other places. You know, you know, you know, you know the drill. And so basically markbradford.org and Alchemy for Life, you're going to find all my goodies in those two places. Mark, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us here. I really appreciate it. For everyone who's out there watching or listening, if you like this conversation, if you want more of this, give it a thumbs up, like, subscribe, share. And I look forward to seeing you again next time. Can, can I interject one last thing? Sure. About what you just said, because I think coming from me as the guest, it is important that they like your show. I mean, as you know, when you're operating a, a podcast or a show, Part of it's in a vacuum and we really need to know. And it, it's great when we hear later that, oh yeah, I love your show. Well, can you just press one little button and like it or share it? Especially if they see an episode that you've done that maybe is not for them, but they have an uncle or an aunt or somebody they know, they should forward that or forward the email so that they can see your show. And you do such a wonderful job too. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And you're a hundred percent right. I mean, podcasts are in many respects, labors of love. Mm -hmm. And the more people that like and subscribe, that's what keeps us going and allows the podcast to continue and definitely sharing. So if you could do all those things, that would be great, Mark. Thank you again. Oh, you're and so welcome. I look forward to seeing you all next time. I do too.